Hello, everyone. Welcome into Above My Pay Grade. My name is Eric. And if you're like me, uh, you see all the bad news, right? And there's we're jumping from one bad news story to the next. But there's the foundational element that is causing all of that. That is our money is distorted. Our money is distorted. So what is money? It's important to understand what is money or what should money be? What should be the characteristics and how we aren't following that as a nation. And so I can kind of predict the future. And so can you. If you see that we're not doing it, then you know in perpetuity it is going to get worse until we fix the problem itself. So I'm going to show you guys this um, this slideshow I pre presented. Uh, before we get started, if you guys don't mind hitting the like button, uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and share this out if you find it useful. So what is money? Pretty benign question. Um, a lot of people would say dollars or whatever currency they use. But money itself has been a whole bunch of things. It's been salt. It's been wheat. It's been seashells. It's been a whole bunch of things. So if that was money and these little paper units are money, what changed, right? And can it change in the future? A lot of people who are living in history, meaning us, think it'll never change. And then all of a sudden it does. So ultimately, money is a language. It is kind of the grease that uh, greases the skids if you will, of society, it, it's a communication network between you and me. It allows strangers to be able to trade. Let's say I grow apples and uh, you have cattle. I need cattle, but you don't need apples. If we don't have money, what do we do? Because I, all I can do is trade you apples, right? Um, so money allows for this, this economic growth where I can specialize in growing apples. We don't have to rely on barter to grow the economy. So it allows for trade with strangers, and it allows specialization of labor. So if, you know, back in the day in the hunter-gatherer times, there was no such thing as a doctorate, right? Somebody who studied one subject for their entire life and became a subject matter expert on it. And that ability to do that has allowed our economy to grow because we have money. We have this language that we can communicate value with one another. And hint, that value has been distorted. That language itself has been distorted. That is the bedrock that is being distorted right now. So it typically, whether it was seashells, whether it was salt, uh, whether it's the paper currency we have today or gold, it is a unit of energy. It is a unit of energy. So you expend energy and trade it for these currency units. And so when you're handing somebody money for what they are selling, whether that be apples, meat, what have you, you're exchanging your energy that you have previously spent that is now held in this currency for the item, right? So a good way to think about this is would you accept credit from a stranger, right? So if, if I want to buy your car, for instance, and I come up to you and I say, hey, um, love that car, but uh, don't have the money. What about an IOU? Or like, uh, I'll give you a couple apples <laughs> or I'll give you a bushel of apples in a couple of years. Whatever it is, it's an IOU. It's credit, right? You typically won't. You might do that with family, but in society, society in aggregate, that does not work. What does work is this trustless system where I'm handing you this, this productivity ticket, this energy ticket, which is money, because you know you can spend it somewhere else. So... Credit typically doesn't work in society unless there's a middleman. That's usually banks. That's a trusted third party. But you would take money over a stranger's word, which is a stranger's credit. So a lot of people don't think about money until it's falling apart. And just like fish and water, you know, if one fish asks another fish, how's the water? They'll say, what is water? Until they're not in it. And then all of a sudden they realize, hey, that thing I was in was pretty nice. That's where I, I thrive. And people don't think about what money is until it's distorted, until they start feeling the pain of inflation. And that distortion, in my opinion, will get worse. And I'm going to go throughout these slides and I'll tell you why. But if you're watching the news and you're like, what gives? Um, is it just a unique politician that's bad? Or maybe if we get a different one in there, it will get better. The answer is no. The system that it's built on, the language that we are using has been so distorted and corrupted that that needs to change before these downstream effects change. And I'll get into that. 
So <laughs> this fish says, hey, how's the water? What the hell is water? People say, what the hell is money? And uh, in reality, they don't think about the properties of money. They think about money all the time, what it can buy them, Lamborghini, what have you. But they don't think about the properties of money and what money should be until it's distorted. So I like to think about our economy and politicians like that house up top. Let's say that house has plumbing issues and our politicians are offering fix it. They're saying, hey, uh, guys, I know you noticed that there's plumbing issues. There's not enough money in Social Security. Uh, we need to keep expanding our, our geopolitical reach and our defense spending and yada, yada, yada. So they're seeing all these problems that are coming up. People can't afford the middle class is shrinking, all this stuff. But it's the plumbing on the house. But what's causing the issue, if we were to fix that, doesn't fix the issue that the foundation is shifting beneath our feet. And that foundation is money. So our economy is that house and it's built on derivatives, tons of debt, all these things that create this foundation that's continually shaky. And all we're trying to do is fix the toilet when the house is literally falling down at the foundation. And until we fix that, until we fix the foundation, the money system itself, these problems will persist. And uh, a lot of people uh, don't think of it that way, but it's true. And I'll show you the math here in a second. But we keep adding pieces, keep building bricks, and just gets shakier and shakier. And you're going to see it as the decade continues. So if we were to build a, a stronger foundation, what are those properties that we want in money? It needs to be a medium of exchange. A lot of these are, are kind of subconscious. You, you, you don't think about them, but you know them to be true. So it's widely accepted. It's the middle of a transaction. It allows for this trustless commerce with a stranger. And it allows for the economy to scale. If we were all hunter-gatherers, if we all had to grow our own food, the economy really can't grow and scale. And uh, barter doesn't allow for that. Barter doesn't allow for the economy to scale. It might work in a, in a microcosm, in a microeconomy, but it does not work as a medium of exchange for the growth of a large economy. It's a unit of account, meaning it can be used to compare goods using a common system, just like one foot is 12 inches. So if that foot kept changing, right, it's 13 inches, right? Uh-oh, it's 14 inches. How well would the house be built? What would the foundation look like if the measurement tool you were using was constantly changing? And that measurement tool in the economy, subconsciously, you might not think about it, but you think about price all the time, right? It is a measuring tool if it's something's expensive or cheap. Right? If, you go to, if you go to Costco and buy peanut butter and it's twice the price it was last month, you're making some calculations in your head. How much do I love peanut butter, right? Is it because, uh, you know, there was uh, not enough peanut butter to go around and there's a higher demand? Or is it because the money system, the measuring stick you're using is distorted? And the reality is the measuring stick today is distorted. The money system itself is distorted. So this unit of account allows for you to access like in your brain, make these calculations. Is this cheap? Is it expensive? And then a store of value. This is probably one of the biggest things that money is not today. It is not a store of value. So it can be spent at a later date without penalty. When the money is losing its value at a exponential rate, 10% one year, 15% the next, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people are forced to go out on the risk curve. They're forced to spend the money today that they otherwise would have saved because it's a, it buys you a certain amount of energy. It's an energy token for this much energy today. And it's an energy token for this much energy tomorrow because it's losing its value compared to goods and services. It might be raising compared to other currency like the dollar is, but that doesn't matter. All things are relative when it comes to how much eggs does it buy you? How much house does it buy you? How much e literal energy does it buy you? How much car does it buy you? It's buying less and less. So those characteristics, are kind of the macro of money, a lot of things fit into that, that those characteristics, you know, so unit of account, um, <clears throat> medium exchange, et cetera, but they're not very practical. So there's some practical characteristics of money. Number one, it has to be portable and uniform. So that's why gold became a little bit uh, less useful in a modern economy. And the reason it became less useful in a modern economy is because it's heavy. 
And so if, if I'm going to a gas station and I'm trying to buy $20 worth of gas and flaking off a gold bar, it's not very practical and it doesn't allow for the economy to scale. Um, so we backed gold with paper, right? But good as gold. You guys remember that, that statement? Good as gold. Paper was gold, essentially. You can always turn it in for gold until we printed more paper than we had gold. Remember that? So it allows for larger purchases if it's portable and faster transactions. So if the economy is just slowing down just because of the money you're using, you got a problem, right? If it can't scale just because the time it takes to transact takes forever, you got a problem, right? So number two, it has to be scarce. One uh, rule I love or quote I love, I've said this many times, Thomas Sowell says, number, the first rule of economics is scarcity. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. And the first rule of politics is to forget about the first rule of economics. So scarcity in money means it typically cannot be a consumer good because if it's a consumer good like salt, for instance, which money used to be, if you're using that as a consumption item, then it, it, the supply is constantly going up and down. Therefore, the price or what it can buy you is constantly going up and down. That's why people, the free market settled on gold because gold isn't really used for a ton of things in the economy. It's used for jewelry and stuff, but you can always melt it and reuse it. But one of my favorite quotes is, if it's scarce, that means it has to, as Nick Zabo says, unforgeable costliness to produce. So gold, if you have a bar of gold, that took energy to produce that. You cannot forge that into existence. And so that's why people put value on gold because it cannot, it doesn't just fall from the sky. It's unforgeable costliness. It costs money to create. So what's the cost of creating money today, you ask? Well, if I just hit one keystroke on my computer, that's about the cost of money today. We don't even print majority of the money. It is one keystroke. So that's a lot of forgeable costliness or lack thereof, in my opinion. So bottom line, it cannot be a store of value if it's not rare, right? So meaning if it just is perpetually growing in supply, it's very hard to be a store of value. So... That's why people use land and all that other stuff. So when I was talking about energy, think about it like this. People think about subconsciously, but if you had to work 80 hours a week to get $1,000, you put 80 hours of energy into that $1,000. So that's how you think about the money subconsciously. Meanwhile, there's somebody on the back end creating that money at infinitum forever, higher and higher amounts of it with the click of a, key, a keystroke. That's Washington. So you understand how costly that money is because you put your hard-earned energy and effort into getting it, acquiring it. But little do you know, there are somebody on the back end, which this will not stop, right, until the pain gets big enough that we want to change. We're not there yet. But you understand the costliness of that money, what you skipped, what you had to go through, et cetera, the, the logistics of life. Meanwhile, somebody's printing it on the back end, therefore devaluing your labor, devaluing your labor, okay? Devaluing the energy you put in. So also money needs to be fungible and divisible. One dollar equals one dollar or five dollars equals one or uh, five one dollar bills. This is why diamonds don't work very well because they're not really fungible. I could have one diamond that's worth more than the five diamonds you have because of the color and clarity of mine or the size is bigger. Okay, so that means it's easily divided into smaller parts. This is why gold had a harder time because number one, it's slow. Number two, if I'm shaving off flakes of gold to buy a coffee, it doesn't really work in the modern economy. And lastly, durability, okay, needs to be able to be used without losing its integrity, thus losing its value. If your dollar, paper dollar, loses its integrity, you can actually go to the mint and get a new one if you didn't know that. They actually take them out of circulation and print new ones. Um, and then verifiable. Sorry, I forgot this one. Verifiable. Remember, remember back in the day, fool's gold. You know, people uh, <laughs> got rich uh, selling fool's gold. But even gold itself can be somewhat simple to verify. But on a macro scale, the entire economy, if I'm handing somebody a bar of gold, there could be tungsten inside. So it's a lot harder to verify what it is. But even the dollar has been... They've, they've 
and hundred dollar bills, especially they've put things in that dollar that make it a lot harder to counterfeit. So you see those people look up at the light and verify that it's real and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it needs to be quickly verifiable. It can't take hours to verify that it's real. Okay. So what's the problem? How does the money system distort these characteristics? The system of money we have today is built on a fundamental lie that we can have our cake and eat it too. Something we tell our kids, right? That this can't be true. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. So it says that trade-offs don't have to be made. We could print, we could sow without reaping. We could print prosperity. That's what politicians I don't know if they actually think it, if they do, or in a, even worse shape. But politically speaking, it is more palatable to sell this lie than it is to tell people, I'm sorry the government lied to you. We can't afford Social Security. It, it is more palatable to sell this lie. And this lie has more consequences that, you know, we can choose to be disciplined today or the discipline will be cho chosen for us in the future. And that's why I keep saying you can kind of predict the future because I know what politicians are going to do. So it is built on this lie that we don't have to make trade-offs. Scarcity doesn't exist. We could print energy. We could print whatever we want because we have the U.S. dollar. And that's to assume that history <clears throat> isn't replete with these stories <laughs> of countries doing this exact thing, trying to print energy, print pr uh, productivity. So what happens when you <clears throat> excuse me, corrupt the ability to communicate with money? In society, think about that and think about if it's being corrupted and what are those downstream effects in your own life and the glue that is holding society together. Is there and is there an incentive to stop the corruption of money from Washington? I don't think there is. Not yet. Not yet. When the pain gets bad enough, there will be because people will demand it, will demand a change. But one of my favorite um, kind of models, Milton Friedman put this out. It's how people spend money. This applies to you and me, right? So this is why no politician is going to change this. Um, number one, the math doesn't work. And number two, we're all the same. You know, human beings are, are have this desire and they can be corrupted, right? And if you had a money printer in your basement, maybe you, you're you Gandhi, right? And you would never, right? But most people would use that money printer. So this is how you spend money. If you, if you are spending your own money on yourself, you seek to economize and have the highest value for what you're purchasing. Now, if you're spending your money on someone else, you seek to economize, but don't seek the highest value. Like if you're buying somebody a present, if you're spending somebody else's money on yourself, you don't seek to economize. You don't look for the best price, right? But seek the highest value because it's for you, right? Now, what happens if you're spending someone else's money on somebody else? What is that? That is Washington. You don't seek to economize and you don't seek the highest value. Because it's not your money. It is not your money. So when you are spending somebody else's money on somebody else, you don't seek the best value. You don't price cut. You don't care. <laughs> and this is Washington in a nutshell. Because there is not no, no finite amount of money. And I always tell people this. If the war in Afghanistan, for instance, if that was debited from your W-2 every year for the last 20 years, you would say, wait a second. What the heck are we doing over there? But how did they debit it from your account? They printed the money. <laughs> Therefore, they inflated the money supply, devaluing your labor. So who has access to this money printer and why is this important? Why is all the economy distorted because of this money printer? There's something called the Cantillon effect. Cantillon effect essentially says the closer you are to the source of money creation, Washington, the more you benefit. So it is not the products you create. It is not the uh, cost cutting that you do. It is not the productivity that you provide the economy. It is how close you are to the money printer. And you see this. You see more and more lobbyists going to Washington. You see people uh, pitching unprofitable garbage like ESG that is unscientific, at least the ESG part, like the solution that they're, they're producing. Why? Because they have access to a printer. And so if they follow what Daddy Washington says, Washington, D.C., then they get access to the printer. So how does, how does this work out in society? Well, in 2020, we printed a whole bunch of money. And one might think that we all got richer because you got a stimmy, I got a stimmy, everybody got a stimmy, and we didn't even have to work. Great, right? 
Not so great. The world's billionaires have gotten $1.9 trillion richer in 2020. Why is that? They're closest to the printer. On top of the fact that the rich own assets, the poorest among us, the people that spend the majority of their income on food, shelter, energy, those things going up, do you think their income is going up commensurate with that? The answer is no. So not only do these people already own assets, but they're first to access the money, first to buy the assets, and then the price goes up, pricing people out of, let's say, the housing market. I don't know where we've seen that, right? So societally, this kind of, you know, the American dream, the hope of, uh, you know, you work hard, and uh, you can have a white picket fence and 2.5 kids and all this kind of st stuff. That American dream is dying. Why? The middle class is shrinking. Concentration of wealth up at the top just because of the Cantillon effect. No fault of their own necessarily. Although I would say if the incentive was there, it's the incentive that's distorted. It's the fact that Washington produces that incentive, that the closer you are to the printer, the wealthier you can be. So in the last 40 years, 50 years, the middle class has shrunk significantly. The lower class has grown and the upper class has grown. So the middle class shrinking. Why is this important? Because in an economy, if there's no mobility, right? If you can't go to the lower class to upper middle class in your lifetime, that's the American dream dying because the rich get richer as they print money and the poor, what's happening is the middle class are shrinking into the lower income and they become more and more dependent on the government. And they say, Hey, this late stage capitalism isn't working. And they don't know we're not a capitalist country, folks. We aren't, we aren't. And so like late stage capitalism isn't working, what have you. And they go to the government for more money printing, which makes the problem even worse, shrinks the middle class even more. More and more Americans are going out and living on credit cards, buy now, pay, pay later, to just keep up with the Joneses, to just keep their lifestyle afloat. So the average American, this is consumer debt, has ninety thousand, over ninety thousand dollars in debt, just to keep their lifestyle afloat. So, do the chickens ever come home to roost? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty, in my opinion. So, what happens next? Next. This is why you can predict the future. Ask yourself, is the dollar going to become more or less corrupted from where we are today? My vote, a whole lot more. And the reason being, we have so much debt in the system that it requires even more debasement, right? So the dollar, it's been lo losing value at, at kind of a boiling frog rate, 2%, 3% a year. But this Perpetual printing of money requires even more printing of money to pay off the debt that we already have. So why don't we just stop spending? Everybody, you know, I've already talked about political reasons why they wouldn't want to, but every single time you try to stop spending, they bring out the hostages. Okay. I posted this on my Instagram the other day, but let's take a listen. This is about the debt ceiling. Okay. Her name is Janet, and she called my office in tears. She was so afraid. She is 64 years old. Her income is $1,200 a month. She has chronic mental illness. She cannot work. She would like to work, but she cannot. And she is so afraid that if they do what they're going to do, that she cannot pay the rent. She cannot pay for any food. She can't pay for the medication that she needs. These tough guys who don't want to negotiate this is the hostage that they want to take. And there are millions of Janets. So what happens? <laughs> you you, you want to ask a question about how we afford it. You want to kill Janet. You want Janet to die. No, not necessarily. But I think we should ask about the trade-offs. We pay for Janet. Then what? Then we got to cut somewhere else. But no, that's not the answer. We can pay for Janet. We can pay for everything. Okay, so politics has come. Has, there's a Freedom Tunes. Uh, I recommend you look at look it up. It's like Politics Day. It's uh, if you ask, you know, everyone wants Janet to survive, of course, yes. But if you ask how to pay for it, then you want bad thing. So we only talk about good things and bad things. Good things, Janet lives. She's happy. Yada yada yada. Bad thing if you ask how we pay for it. So we're living in this pretend world where there is no costliness 
to money. You can just print at infinitum. We all know that's not true. But the question is, are the consequences getting worse? Yes, because we keep printing more and more, right? So there's more and more leverage in the system, just like that house and that foundation I was talking about. So <clears throat> this was, this just lets you know how politicians think today, okay? So I know I don't like the dunking. You're like, oh, you can dunk on her. She's such an idiot, whatever. But it's just put yourself in Washington's seat and think about this is how a lot of them are thinking. And by the way, this is how a lot of Americans are thinking, which means it's going to get worse before it gets better because we have to have consequences. And when those consequences come and are unavoidable, money printer does nothing, then people are like, okay, they, we, we've been lied to. And I've been, <laughs> I've been trying on this channel, which this is why I ask you guys to share it out, to wake people up. Like this problem cannot be avoided. It is only a matter of how much we want to kick the can down the road and make the problem even worse. How much do we want our great grandkids to pay for it? We keep saying, oh yeah, we can, we can just kick the can down the road. We can live off of, uh, we can sow without reaping no, or reap without sowing rather. No, we can't. That's not how money works. The consequence is you debase the money supply or you debase the value of the money, which distorts of all, the, all the things in society. So let's listen. This one gave, gave me a chuckle here. This is AOC. They are accusing Democrats of saying we spend too much. For anyone that wants to entertain that thought, I ask you to think about the last time a person said, has said in this country that the government does too much for them, that their Social Security check was too high, that teachers are paid too much. When was the last time anyone has heard or seen that? Great question, AOC. Um, what I recommend is you give everyone in the United States a billion dollars. Then the government's super healthy Helperton. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense. You know what she's saying doesn't make sense. And I hope that deep down she knows that that doesn't make sense. But the, that's not the government's job. Where does the government get the money? Where does it get the money, AOC? But this is, it's, I'm, I'm not saying this to dunk on but that this is how people are thinking today and why are they thinking this way is because the money system has been so corrupted that this american dream of going to college and getting a good job and all this kind of stuff is dead because they take two or one step forward and it's two steps back from the money printer so her solution to the problem is guess what more money printing <laughs> Oh, uh, isn't it great? So this is why I know it's going to get worse before it gets better. And you see calls calls like this. Cancel rent. Okay. I get it. It's, it's extremely expensive. But the onerous regulations <laughs> on building, right? It's all supply and demand. Um, we can get into that on another video. But Or cancel student loans. How do we cancel student loans? Where does the money come from? Oh, that's right. We print it. You notice a trend here. We print it, which means debasing your labor. It means deba debasing the value of the money. So, you know, we brought out Janet, and, and this is bipartisan, right? It doesn't matter what person's in power. This is how the system works. You have to take on more debt, just like if you had credit cards, right? And you were living above your means, which ultimately that's what debt is. It is pulling productivity from the future into the present. Okay. If you kept doing that with credit cards, the only way that keeps going is if you're able to take on another credit card. So our debt has grown. We take on another credit card. We, we sell more bonds, right? And so it has grown. Notice the hockey stick, right? It's not like this linear line. It gets worse by a significant margin every single administration because this is how the system works. And now we're at the tail end of that where the consequences are becoming more severe. Every single time we print, it gets even worse. The hockey sticks get steeper, right? And so what happens? Well, the value of the dollar, what the dollar can buy you goes down. Notice kind of a similar chart. The red goes up and to the right. That's the money supply. And the value of the dollar goes down to the right. That's the purchasing power of the dollar. So do you think that's going to continue? The answer is yes. And there comes a point where 
value is so low and it's happening so fast, that's when the consequences kick in. People go, okay, everything Washington's doing with the printing and promising is making the problem worse. And, and that glue that holds the society together, you cannot make any predictions. You can't make any measurements because the, the unit of account, that measurement tool is broke. And we're headed there at a exponential rate, especially with attitudes like that in Washington. Speaking of Washington, CBO comes out with this and set openly, this is a congressional budget office, right? They openly say, just so you know, uh, we're going to hold a lot more debt into the future, like $700 trillion or percentage of GDP, rather, 700% of GDP by 2090. And they're, you know, pretty, um, I would say conservative on their estimates because CBO, the government, right? But their conservative estimate is saying it will continue to get worse and worse and worse. So there com comes a point where society goes, nope, not happening anymore. This doesn't work. So we're in this fantasy land that we can have our cake and eat it too. And I, what I tell my followers all the time, you have to purchase things the government can't print. Don't go out on leverage, but you have to purchase things the government can't print. And then think to yourself, how does this get fixed? And when will society want it to be fixed? I think society will want it to be fixed when the pain gets so bad, when the measuring stick, the dollar gets so distorted that day to day prices are changing that they go, wait a second. I, I don't know economics, but I know what Washington is saying isn't working because every solution they come up with, which involves just printing more of the currency units, isn't working. It's only making the problem worse. That's when society wakes up because that boiling frog syndrome works for so long. And now we're at that, that tail end of that, that debt cycle. So imagine this. Imagine I took a loan from you. Okay. I'm a nice guy, honest guy, right? I take out a loan from you. Thanks. You give me an interest rate, which is the price of that loan. And it came time for you to collect the interest payment, but I'm stressed. So I don't have a lot of money. So I ask for another loan to pay off the interest payment from the previous loan. How many times you might raise the interest rate on me because now I've become a little bit more of a risk. But let's say you give me that loan. How many times would you continue to give me that loan before you realize this guy's never paying me back? He needs to take on loans to pay off the previous loan. How, how many times would that have to happen? Rhetorical question, but that's what our government does. They never pay off the debt. They just take on more debt from foreign governments, from pensions, and yada, yada, yada. And they never pay off that debt. So other governments, foreign governments, are wising up to this fact. And foreign holders of U.S. treasuries have dropped precipitously. This doesn't mean the dollar's going to fail overnight. But the way we are able to live above our means is we sell our debt to the world. And since we have the world reserve currency, they want to save in it. They buy them. They buy our treasuries. And those treasuries have a lower interest rate than inflation. And they're starting to make calculations. And they're like, wait a second. I'd rather hold gold, Bitcoin, manure. I don't know anything because that can be used as fertilizer. But this paper is garbage, right? And it's continually to be garbage. So we keep going to them for a loan for them to buy our treasuries. And the, we still owe them. So we... <laughs> We're asking for a loan to pay off the other loan. See how this works? It's called a Ponzi scheme, okay? But this has consequences. And yes, we've been doing it for a while. We've hit the gas pedal. And so you say, why, why now? Why is it now different? We've been doing this for such a long time. Well, we hit the gas pedal in the last three years, and we came to a stopping point where our interest payment on our debt is now more than our entire defense spending, the most powerful military in the world. We spend more on interest payments and that's growing exponentially. See the problem. Okay. So these other countries are wising up and they're dumping treasuries. Again, doesn't mean the dollar's going to die tomorrow. Doesn't mean there's no demand for treasuries, but there's less. There is less. And how do American companies respond? Because if you are closer to the printer, you can be wealthier. Okay. And I've said this a million times, the printer turns honest people into suckers. And I use the example uh, of the pandemic. Let's say you, you are a, 
an airline who wants to run margins, you, you want to run a profitable company, but you want to save for a rainy day. So therefore, you're not taking risks with your rainy day fund. You save some of that money. That means you don't buy new airplanes. That means you don't hire new pilots and all this stuff because you have a rainy day fund. Because you know when that rainy day comes, you are going to have to buy or going to get to buy the other airlines who aren't taking that that risk defense measure, right? So here comes the pandemic. So, uh, demand drops precipitously in the airlines. You, good for you. You have a rainy day fund, which means you can also potentially buy other airlines' assets. But instead of that, the government prints money, hands it out to all these airlines, so you become a sucker. You're an idiot. Why? Because those other airlines were able to take risks and buy stuff with that money because they didn't save a rainy day fund. And they were growing faster than you. They were growing faster than you because they were able to spend that money on new planes, new, new pilots, yada, yada, yada. And the rainy day came and the government bailed them out. You became the sucker. It reminds me of this scene from <clears throat> the big short. Uh, I think Mark Baum or some, uh, this, uh, I think that was his name, but he's talking about mortgage backed securities. And this is exactly how I feel about the economy today. Let's listen to what he, what he says. Living in era of fraud in America, not just in banking, but in government, education, religion, food, even baseball. What bothers me isn't that fraud is not nice or that fraud is mean. It's that for 15,000 years, fraud and your short-sighted thinking have never, ever worked. Not once. Jesus, we're 37. Eventually, we're 37. people get caught. Like things fucking go south. Plummeting, man. It's fucking plummeting. When the hell did we forget all that? So listen to what he's saying about fr like fraud not paying off. Because eventually you get caught. You pay the consequences. If you take the risk, you pay the consequences. Again, with that airline example. I thought we were better than this. I really did. And the fact that we're not doesn't make me feel all right and superior. It makes me feel sad. Every time I fucking hit refresh, it's dropping, man. It always goes. goes. Yeah. And as fun as it is to watch pompous, dumb Wall Streeters be wildly wrong, and you are wrong, sir. I just know that at the end of the day, average people are going to be the ones that are going to have to pay for all of this because they always, 32. always do. And guess what? He was right. The average person paid for 2008 to bail out those banks who take on, took on massive leverage, who did things that what, weren't that smart, incentivized by the government, by the way. But that same thing is happening today. That same thing is happening today. It allows for these unprofitable garbage ideas like what you're going to hear from Larry Fink of BlackRock, who is a big proponent of ESG, ESG, which I'm not talking about the science of global warming. I'm talking about the solution science. ESG doesn't work. This wind solar thing, it doesn't work at the levels of energy that we need. But tons of investment banks are investing in it. Why? Because Washington prints money if you do that and gives it to you. A lot less risk. Because we have access to the money printer. Back to the Cantillon effect. So listen to how businesses are reacting to this incentive. Listen to what Larry Fink says. Well, behaviors are going to have to change. And this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors. And at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. Forcing behaviors. Okay, cool. Um, last I checked. Okay, let's say ESG did work. Wind solar, right? Cheaper, better, denser. Do you think that wouldn't sell? <laughs> it doesn't sell because it's not cheaper, better, denser at forms of energy. It's not. It's less reliable. So how do they get you to buy off on this idea? They force behavior, economically speaking. Um, with, by the way, your money. Isn't that gross? So the market, uh, I've said this many times, the market is rational. You and I, the participants in the market are rational. If somebody is irrational, does irrational things, they will eventually pay for it, like fraud. But what does the money printer allow? It allows for irrational greed to be profitable. 
So you have these greedy companies, which I'm not arguing that companies and individuals can't be greedy. They can, right? But if you take risk, you don't pay for, and I and you pay for it, the, the taxpayer, that's when we have a massively huge problem. So it's the person who cozies up to the printer and politicians that makes the most money. And so it it allows for people to distort this this measuring stick, which is money, right? Which is not the measuring stick it should be. And the and the government's constantly changing what that measurement actually is. In your life it's not. You still work 40, 60 hours a week for a similar amount of money, just buying you less and less. So what happens next? This is why I say you can predict the future. We have to we have to ride this train till it falls off and and like people are getting hurt and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, then people in America wake up and say, no, no, no. Because politicians, their they're one desire to get reelected. Okay. And how they get reelected, everyone's ticked at them because they keep printing money. Okay. I like uh, Exeter's Pyramid. Um, nobody special finance turned me on to this, but we live in a world where most money is at that top of that pyramid, this upside down pyramid, where there's so many derivatives, unfunded government liabilities, corporate muni bonds, all these things is just more and more leverage, more and more money in the system. And you notice down the bottom, gold, that's not changing, really. And paper money used to be built on gold, but the paper money itself is also being distorted, which makes these up the pyramid distort even more which you'll notice on the left-hand side, it says higher risk of default. Unfunded government liabilities, 210 trillion of those in the United States government alone. How do we pay for it? If we actually do, we print it. Distort the dollar even more. So knowing all this, why am I saying all this? I'm 100% certain, there's not a lot of certainties out there, but I am 100% certain that the dollar will continue to debase, meaning lose purchasing power. The question is, what is it revalued or replaced with? Because that revaluation or replacement doesn't happen without a significant amount of pain. You can front run that and know, hey, uh, I know this is coming. I know all these stories are going to keep coming out, banks failing, housing market getting destroyed and all this kind of stuff. But you have to ask yourself, will it be replaced with the properties of money that I talked about at the beginning? with the money that has those properties because your average citizen won't say, Hey, yeah, you can revalue with another fiat. Almost every single, really every single uh, currency that has ever been destroyed. They came back to a currency that was valued by something that the government can print oil, gold, commodity of some kind, something that people trusted in because guess what? All trust in the government's gone. So what will they revalue or replace it with? So, Downstream effects of this, you know, middle class shrinking, people can't make ends meet, et cetera. Unfortunately, in society, what it means is a lot of despair. You know, during the Great Depression and, and in the USSR, one of the leading causes of death was over drinking because people were so depressed, especially men, couldn't provide for their families. And you see this in American cities. I live close to Denver, you see this all the time. This is in Philadelphia. It's extremely sad. You see society breaking down. You see more violence because purpose is leaving for a lot of reasons. And and the, the, the biggest person, I'm, I'm religious, I'm Christian. Uh, people have lost that. And the, the money system itself, like the American dream promise, like people have lost that, like working hard and their labor bringing some kind of value because people up in Washington are distorting all of that, right? The puppeteer up there distorting things. And at the tail end of this, again, I don't think we're going to hyperinflate, but I think you're going to see high inflation higher than you've ever seen in your life in this decade. Hyperinflation is like 50% per month. But you're going to, to have a lower standard of living, significantly lower standard of living if you don't protect yourself uh, at the end of this decade than at the beginning, significantly more, losing 10, 15, 
20%. And that has downstream effects on society. People don't choose to start a family. Uh, people are in despair, yada, yada. But this is the Venezuelan Boulevard. This guy's in Colombia. He talks about what the Venezuelan Boulevard looks like in Colombia. Of so it's more valuable to make paper mache snakes out of than what it buys you. A lot of people think. This will never happen in America. And I asked those people why. <laughs> why won't it happen here? Um, I don't think it'll happen overnight. And I think we might be the last one because we have the world preserved currency. But the world changes, folks. And it's, the ground is shifting beneath your feet. The question is, are you going to jump on solid ground? To me, that solid ground is gold, silver, Bitcoin, to a certain extent, real estate. But you have to hedge against certain locations, right? Because there's geographical risk to where you have your real estate, specifically in the United States, hint, California, um, where government overreach as these these problems persist and get worse, and they will get worse. Government overreach into the economy becomes worse, and your average citizen begs for more because the government's giving them this sweet solution. You don't get paid enough. More currency units in the system. That's how we fix the problem. Not going to work. And that's why I think it's going to get better before people wise up and say, hey, guess what? Our system of money is broken fundamentally, and we can't keep fixing the toilet without fixing the foundation. All right. I hope you guys got something out of this. If you don't mind, if you haven't already, hit the like, hit subscribe, share this out with your friends if you found it useful, and I'll see you guys next Monday. Peace.